Well, I served in the U.S. Army. I enlisted into the National Guard while I was in high school in Spanish Fork, Utah. Uh, later, I, uh, I decided to enlist and go into the regular Army. It was uh, quite an experience. Uh, the military at that time, the drill sergeants, was very tough. They could physically abuse you, they could wear you out, they could degrade you like you've never been degraded before, but they made me a better soldier, a better person, and I accepted that as part of what it was. And as they told me at that time, in order to function, you can't operate with every individual attempting to make a decision. You operate like a fine machine. Everybody has to function on the same page, and that's why they made it so tough. And yeah, it was tough. I, the happiest days of that time was the day I graduated from basic training. I went home, and from there, I, for specialized training, they sent me to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri for combat engineers uh, and building floating bridges to get our tanks and that across the rivers. In the winter in the early 50s, I was ordered to serve in Korea. Uh, after 21 days and 21 nights of being seasick and praying to God that he'd just wash me overboard because I couldn't take that seasickness any longer, uh, we arrived at the uh, harbor in Incheon, but the tide goes in and out so fast that the ships cannot come in, so they docked, put us in LSTs, got us within about 100 yards of the beach, which the British was controlling at that time. And we got in LSTs, and then we got out and waded ashore in a freezing cold and snow. When we reached the, Brit the, the beach, the British told me to hurry up and get on this truck, and it was taking us to our units. I got on the truck. Uh, you got to realize at that time I was had just turned 17 from Spanish Fork, Utah. This was a whole whole new world. So I climbed on the truck in the dark. I didn't say anything. Nobody said anything to me. And finally the truck was full and we began to pull out. And I heard these guys talking. But they wasn't speaking English, and I had no idea uh, what they were speaking. And after an hour or so, I, t I turned to a guy and I asked him a question, and he just looked at me and shook his head. And finally, one guy moved down and he spoke English, and I was in a truck with the Turkish army. And of course, I've been told, don't ask anything. If the military wants you to know, they'll tell you. So uh, we traveled north uh, above Moon Sawney, just, just uh, south of the M. Jim River. And we came to a Turkish compound and we unloaded. And I was totally confused as to what to do, what went on. But the one uh, uh, Turkish soldier, he come over and talked to me and said, uh, seems to be some confusion here, but everything's all right. You're with us and we're going to take care of you and we'll get you back to where you belong. Well, I didn't realize at that time it was going to take a little longer to get me back. I was assuming that later that night or the next day somebody was coming to get me but uh, 
several weeks went by, and now I'm assuming that I was due to report to an American unit, and now I'm AWOL. But upon speaking to the Turkish, they knew nothing about anything like that, and not to worry. And that was an experience. Uh, the Turks are great soldiers, but you don't want to become a prisoner by the Turkish army. That was a very bad experience to watch what happened to people that was captured by the Turkish army, especially coming from a little town in Utah and never witnessing any type of violence like this whatsoever. But uh, finally they come and they said, uh, we found your unit and we're going to take you over there. They took me over there and it was a British unit. So I explained to them my dilemma and what was going on, and they said, okay, we'll, we'll take care of that. Well, i got to be honest. After about four or five days with the British, I was wishing I was back with the Turks. All I heard about is how they won the war and the Yanks took credit for it, that they didn't need us. I told them, I don't remember bombs or rockets dropping on New York City. It seems like it was London and we come to help you out. But about a week later, uh, the 3rd Combat Engineers 1st Cavalry Division was in the area and they got me hooked up there. And uh, I, I, I was there about a year, uh, served with them came home, uh, got out of the military for a short period of time, Vietnam started up, and for the like of me I can't think now what I was thinking, but I decided I was going back. So I re-enlisted, went back in, assuming that I would just go to a unit and that, but they sent me back to basic training. Well, after serving and knowing how things actually run, to have to go back and go through this like you was a, 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 a raw rookie and go through basic training again at Fort Polk, Louisiana in the middle of the summer, that, that was not good. But finally I, uh, I got through there and they sent me to uh, Camp Prince, West Virginia to continue my training on floating bridges and power boat operations. So I assumed that that was what I would do. But then I was sent to the Republic of Panama and was told that I would be a communication specialist and worked in the cryptograph room. So I began my training in that and then they sent me to the Marines jungle operational training. And that was a dilemma. I mean, I, I, I was trained to build floating bridges now I'm in a cryptograph room, now I'm being trained by the Marines to be a jungle expert. And during this time, the riots began in Panama uh, with the, the students, college students, rioting against DENI, the D-E-N-I, which is the, their equivalent to our FBI. And I was chosen, along with a gentleman from Jamaica to take an automobile registered in Panama, not canal zone plates, and go in and bring all of the dependents, women and children, back to the canal zone. And during this time, we was stopped and they was tipping over cars, burning cars, 
and attempted to turn our car over and I had two women and four children in there with me and I was able to draw a 45 and get them to back off far enough that we was able to escape and go back into the canal zone. Uh, at that time they said that this created a problem and because I had drawn a weapon on them and that, that the Panamanian officials wanted to talk to me and I didn't agree to that and two days later they put me on a plane and flew me to Germany leaving my wife alone in Panama and so then I served five years in Germany finally with the help of the Canadian government because the US military would not help me because they said I did not have permission from the military to marry a Panamanian resident. But the Canadian government helped out and managed to get her to Germany. And upon our return from Germany, they would not allow my wife back into the United States even though we was legally married and, and had letters from the consulate general and everything. And so it took hours of red tape to get the Panamanian consulate general and the U.S. consulate general before they'd allow my wife back into the United States. So that was uh, that was a very bad experience. And from there, as time went on, I wound up uh, with orders to Vietnam. I went to. Uh, Vietnam and at the time I had a profile because I had stomach ulcers and I'd been in uh, Gorgas Naval Hospital being treated so I had a profile and they said that I could not be over 25 miles from definitive medical care and so that I would go to Saigon and work in the crypto rooms and that in Saigon. But after about four days, they started calling out names and they called my name to get on this helicopter. And I got on a helicopter and was flown to the jungles and dropped off and I was with G Troop, 11th Armored Cavalry. So, they said that I was the new communications chief and that I needed to start repairing uh, radios. Things was in pretty bad shape at the time I arrived there, uh, which I did. Uh, after about a month, they said they wanted to see me at, uh, back in the rear of the fire base, and I was sent back there, and our first sergeant was back there because he had medical issues, and they made me the acting first sergeant and sent me back to my unit. And I served out the rest of my time there, not only as communications chief, but as the acting first sergeant, which my decisions of who put who, who was on night patrol, who would do this, was constantly my decision of who I put in jeopardy. And some of my decisions didn't work. But the war goes on. You do the best you can. And in time, I come to realize. It wasn't my mistake, it was a combination of many things and it could have happened and it did happen over and over again that things did not go the way you planned or the information you was given may not have been exact what it was and you got overwhelmed and so you're going to lose lives. and. Uh, It 
it was hard. Uh, after a time, I began to realize we wasn't there to win the war. We was there to protect American interest in Vietnam and the rubber plantations. And that all these young guys was dying, and did it really matter? And I tried every day not to let that affect my decisions and, and the different things that we did. But, for instance, on Highway 1 from Saigon to Phnom Penh, Cambodia, that was one of our responsibilities is to keep Highway 1 open. Well, parallel in Highway 1 is rubber plantations. So every day we would take fire from the rubber trees, but we could not return fire. Not because they didn't want us to kill the enemy, they didn't want us to, dis to destroy the rubber trees. So we're trading lives for rubber trees. And that was hard. That was hard on me, it was hard on all the guys, and you knew that every single time you went up that highway, you was going to get shot at and could do nothing about it. Just keep moving and hope for the best. Fortunately, 11th Armored Cavalry was in tanks. And a lot of the small arms coming out of there did no damage, but occasionally RPGs or 22 millimeter rockets and that would hit a tank and then we had a problem. Now you're down, you have to call for air support, you have to get that tank out, you have to protect everybody without returning fire. So that was uh, a bad situation. And I think that uh, I know the guys was very discouraged and when I would come in to, to the NDP every night we'd make an NDP and, and set up and then the guys would say, Sarge, what are we going to do? Why do we have to get shot at and can't do nothing about it? And I tell them, that's beyond my control. That comes from G2. And beyond G2, someone in Washington is making that decision. We can't make that decision. We're here. We've got to make the best of it. And so, and I won't say this was in all cases, but there was a way out. And that was to get a hold of drugs, which was easy to get a hold of there in the villages of, of Vietnam, marijuana. And when I would go around checking and decide who would be on what duty that night, they'd be sitting there smoking a joint. Now I had no choice but to call in the chaplain and that, and these people were sent to China Beach where the donut dollies took care of them and everything, and then finally they were shipped to Hawaii and that, and they got out of combat. Was they cowards? Maybe some of them. Maybe some of them said, I'm not going to die for this. I'm going to get out of this no matter what. I'm... Maybe they never smoked marijuana before, but they didn't want to die without being able to fight for the cause. And I think a lot of them chose that method to get out of that situation. I would take myself and two fellow members of the troops, uh, cross over the border for two, three miles approximately where this trail supposedly was located, uh, look the situation over and come back and then we could determine then and pass that information on to G2 or whoever needed to know. And uh, so at that point, a uh, huge clearing and uh, tanks all set up, uh, similar to a nighttime 
defensive position, but not a complete one, more of a herringbone type operation. And uh, we took off with virtually no supplies other than our uh, weapons and a canteen full of water. And uh, we was moving through a large opening that had tall elephant grass and that in it. And we were sitting there looking down and we could see what appeared to be a huge, almost like a road, but something that had had a lot of traffic, foot traffic, vehicle traffic, where it looked like a lot of movement had came through. And all of a sudden, we heard some dogs barking. And then we looked up and here come hundreds of North Vietnamese troops moving south on that trail. So immediately we dropped down in the elephant grass. I told the guys, don't move, don't breathe, don't do a goddamn thing because they got dogs. And if them dogs spot us, we're dead. We just got to wait. They're going to pass. They're going to go through it. I told the guys, don't worry about a thing. We're going to be okay. They'll pass. And the worst imaginable thing, they came down and about a hundred yards from us, they stopped and started setting up camp. If you can imagine. What was going through my mind at that time. Why are they stopping? How long are they going to be here? How long before the dogs find us? And it looked like a, a situation we may not get out of. But at that point, I couldn't talk to the guys. I couldn't tell them. I, I, I couldn't say anything, hoping that they're sensing what I'm sensing, that we're in a, a, a bad situation. So as evening came and they began to build fires and start cooking, several times the dogs came within 10 feet of us, but the wind was blowing into our faces and the dogs didn't pick up our scent somehow, miraculously. I mean, when you see these dogs and you can actually see them through the grass, you figure you're dead. It's over. But uh, they didn't. Finally, night came, came, and I thought maybe under the cover of darkness we can run, make a run for it. But then I, I constantly heard noise. I heard the dogs, and I thought if we start to run and the dogs hear us, they're going to get us. And the noise, because I didn't dare look up. Was they putting out booby traps? Was they setting out like we do claymore mines at night? And finding our way back out of there without getting caught may be difficult in the dark. So we laid there, and for three days and three nights they stayed there. We couldn't get a drink of water. We couldn't relieve ourselves. We couldn't even move a hand. Is this? And finally, I, I thought, one more day, and it's over. But it might be better than being taken prisoner. I was not going to be taken alive, no matter what. And I finally, early. On the third day, or it could have been the fourth day, shit, I don't know now, I uh, had decided that I was going to tell the guys, we got to make a break. If, they, if we, we can't live, we're, we're going to die. This is, and in the meantime, mosquitoes have bitten us, ants on us, bugs on us. Christ, it was. And I was within minutes of, of making that decision, which would have probably got us killed, but 
It's either that or lay there and die. They suddenly picked up and started loading up. And when the last dog and the last person in that group, and there was hundreds, made the turn and disappeared, we jumped up and we started running. And we ran for three miles nonstop back to our rendezvous area. And when we got there, our troop was gone. And the clearing was empty. So I began to second guess myself and I thought, I was wrong. I got us back to the wrong place. So immediately I began to look and then I see all the remains of tank tracks and where they'd turned and where they'd left and I followed it out and they went back the way we'd came in. So at that particular time, I'm thinking probably that that big of a unit is not going to try to cross over into Vietnam. They're, they're, they've probably got other plans and so the best thing to do is just start following the tank tracks and it's a long ways to where we're going but I felt that it would be a more secure area and so after walking about two hours come up on an infantry unit and they said yes, they knew where our unit was, they was not that far away, they was able to radio them and they came back and got us. My question is, where the hell you left? And they said yes, because we had orders to do this and that and I said well, Nobody's notified anybody's family and they said yes, we've already notified your wife and your mother that you're missing an action somewhere in South Vietnam or Cambodia. And at that time I just went crazy. I pictured my wife telling my children that I was missing an action and probably dead or my mother telling my brothers and family members. So I told them, I don't care what, I don't care how, I want a Mars thing set up, I want to call them, and I want to call them now. And they arranged it, and I called them. And you cannot believe, nobody talked for five minutes, everybody was crying. tears of joy, of course, but I thought of how much they'd been put through and what they had discussed and all that from the time they was notified until I told them I was still alive. Some of the, the vivid uh, memories that I remember is uh, we did a lot of our operations uh, south, uh, clearing the jungles and all that, uh, just north of Saigon and over toward Nui Bao Din, known as Black Virgin Mountain, and and uh, I forget the names of the different small places. The Boloi Woods was one of them, and uh, we ripped them jungles every day and uh, looking for tunnels, looking for villages that were sympathizers to the Viet Cong or, or the North. And uh, that was a, a bad situation and sometimes uh, there would be North Vietnamese regulars, mo mo most usually Viet Cong that had infiltrated these and what we did is we flew it, we dropped leaflets ahead of time letting them know that we was coming and to clear the village to be out of there because we're looking for certain things and 
it may be that we have to destroy that village, so be out of there. But rarely did that ever happen. When we got there, the village was completely occupied. There was women, there was kids. It didn't happen to me, but I know it did happen where they sent a kid out or something and he was booby trapped and the guys went over to approach him and blew the kid up in the, in the, in the American troop also. So this created a, a big dilemma of what to do. And many times suddenly we would begin to take small arms fire and the decision was to destroy the village. Well, when you start hitting a village with 152 millimeter can rounds, mortars, white phosphorus and that, it destroys the village and it destroys everybody in it. And that was uh, a very sad thing. And after we backed off and the area was secured and aerial support came in and then we made the sweeps through to assess the damage and there was dead people everywhere, women, kids. How many was bad guys? It was impossible to determine at that time. Uh, but we had accomplished what they sent us there to do. And I thought at that time after the first one that I was involved in that uh, the word would get out. And the next village that we was going to approach and we put the flyers out and and they was given 72 hours and that they would be gone. I would think if I lived in one of them and I knew that the American army was coming and that their plan was to clear that area of whatever might be there that they didn't deem necessary or hostile, I'm leaving. But. Next one you roll into and same thing. It just looked like a village of people that you ran into anywhere, everyday life. And sometimes we didn't have to kill everybody. We managed to get the guys out or they left or we was able to kill them. But then it become a decision, what about the village? And if the decision came down that to destroy the village, then we had to evacuate all them people out of there. And where they went, I don't know. But then we burned the village to the ground. and Because there's a lot of little things that the Viet Cong could use. When, whenever we would leave an NDP, every plastic silverware spoon from sea rations, every single thing was put into a huge pit and destroyed with C4. So they could not use anything there to use as a trigger mechanism or anything to set off their weapons. And so the same thing had to happen in a village. There was a lot of things there that they could use to improvise and make things that they needed because they did not have supply lines like we do. What they had, they brought with them. And they didn't have daily resupplies, but they was masters of improvising and making booby traps with spoons and wires or cans or lids, anything. So everything had to be destroyed. So one day, uh, we come up on a complex of tunnels and that, and our commanding officer, Captain Clark, decided that we would dismount and 
go in and clear them tunnels. Well, we had what we called Kit Carsons, and they was Cambodians that served in the units and that, and it would be a short time to get some there and send them in. But his decision was that they would dismount and go check it out. Shortly after they disappeared into the the wood line, we, they took small arms fire. So I told everybody, dismount with your small arms weapons and we will try to maneuver in and, and help them out. And just as I rounded a thing, I took, we took small arms fire again and I dove down and when I come to a stop, I realized that that was Captain Clark laying there and he had been wounded. And so, after a few minutes of returning fire back and forth, uh, they suddenly just broke off and left. We called for air support, saturated the area. I called for a dust off for Captain Clark. Unfortunately, he had taken some shots to the liver and was flown to Hawaii and passed away several days later. Uh, but on a daily problem there was the constant spraying. And they told us that the decision was made that they'd use in other areas they was going to use down there to defoliage the trees with a defoliaging unit. So n none of us being familiar with that, we never questioned it or anything. They came through constantly and sprayed for mosquitoes or sprayed for whatever. We didn't know. And all we was told was when they're coming in, you'll get the call. Take your uh, rubber-coated poncho, put it over you, and stay down for a few minutes. And once they've left the area, well, you're good to go. And we would get up and start moving. Well, your poncho was covered in spray. Everything on the tanks was covered and sprayed, the trees and that had spray, so you got this all over you, Every time after time. Sometimes maybe it was mosquitoes, sometimes we didn't know what it was, and we wasn't told what it was. So we just uh, went on, never thought about it. There was many days that you couldn't get to a shower. Maybe you begin to set up an NDP and you begin to hang the canvas bags to heat the water a little so you could wash and you'd begin to take 122 millimeter rockets firing and so dinner was canceled, showers was canceled, you went into a 360 fire mode and by the time it was over, uh, you just tried to get a little rest, clean your weapons, and get ready for the next day. And so, just thinking that you felt uncomfortable, that you itched or you burned and that, well, it was uh, just from all the mosquito spray or whatever, you know, it was just uh, what it was. And uh, as it turned out, uh, several years later, I found that these various unknown or unnamed agents and Agent Orange was very harmful to humans. But it took many years for me to find that out. As uh, the war began to wind down and uh, the 11th Armored Cavalry was one of the last combat troops left in Vietnam and uh, uh, I was due to stand down and rotate home in uh, two or three weeks and uh, we hit a, a roadside bomb and uh, it blew off several road wheels on the, the tanks and several of the guys received dust offs and I, uh, my eardrums was broken and I had uh, some shrapnel in uh, my right arm and my right leg. 
but I was just treated by the company, the troop medic, and he pulled the, the shrapnel out and put butterfly stitches on it and that and said that uh, my ears would be okay, the, the eardrums would stop bleeding and things would be better. And so we went on and finally we had about a week left in the country and we was in an area by then we had moved all of our equipment back because we was going to turn it over to the South Vietnamese Army when we left the tanks, the guns and everything. And I decided that uh, we was going to make a run to Saigon to try to pick up a few things in Pasex. Uh, uh, where you could buy things and order them and have them sent home. And so myself, uh, the driver and one other, uh, took a jeep and was starting towards Saigon. And we come around a, a curve and we took some small arm fire. Well, that was a total surprise. All we had on us was our side arms and so the driver stepped on the gas take off and about that time uh, south to me his farmer was driving these water buffalo and that across the road and we swerved to miss it and went off and flipped upside down and landed in a ditch and the jeep landed on my leg and my leg was broken and a bunch of uh, the farmers and that soon uh, the shooting stopped almost immediately after we tipped over and it was quiet. We never returned fire. We just laid there. And these farmers came over, righted the jeep, got us out, got us in it, and they took me to Benoit Air Base in Saigon where I was put in, in a uh, full leg cast and everything. Uh, Four or five days later, uh, I boarded a plane and uh, flew to uh, Oakland Army Terminal. My plane then, my plan was to go to San Francisco and fly home to Salt Lake City where my brother would meet me. but. Unfortunately, something happened and my plane was scheduled for the next day. So I took my baggage, the stuff I had with me, and put it on the plane in Oakland and had it flown to San Francisco and I would pick it up in baggage when I got there, ready to go home. When we got there and we went in and we started the baggage, the whole floor in the baggage area was covered in these people all dressed in white with things over the top of their heads and everything and they're laying there and they wouldn't move and so I begin to take my foot to get them to move and they begin to call me baby killer murderers and everything and these guys come over I assume was either police or air force airport security and told me don't touch them and was very rude and I said but my bags are on the thing and I have a flight going out of San Francisco I have to to fly there and uh, or I mean I, I came in from there and I have to get my baggage to go on to Salt Lake City and finally after some discussion, one of the security went forward, got my baggage and everything, and I went through and rechecked it. But all this time, these guys was laying there chanting things and calling us names, and some of the people was calling us names, uh, just civilian people in the airport. And I got on the plane, and I flew to Salt Lake City and, and uh, went home on leave waiting my next assignment and the people in my community which is a small town of Spanish Fork, Utah I was received very well 
Unfortunately, I had a couple of things. One day I had to go to Fort Douglas, Utah. Uh, that's where you had to go if you was on leave and you was getting pay. You had to go up there. And I went to Salt Lake City in a uniform and sitting in a restaurant, I noticed people looking at me and making comments. And uh, one guy walked by and says, I hope you're proud of yourself for all the people you murdered and walked out. And I thought, everything I've been through, everything I tried to do, and I come home and I'm treated this way. And for several years after, I met with more negative remarks than I did remarks congratulating me or thanking me for her service. And it taken years and years and years until people have finally come to say, thank you for your service. But the damage of all them years and the way I felt, and I never even wanted to talk, I never wanted to tell anybody I was in the military. Because that was going to start a confrontation. I was proud of what I'd done. But the people of my country wasn't proud of me of what I did, and that hurt. When I came home from Vietnam, I had a cast on my leg. I went to Nellis Air Force Base and was treated there, and finally the cast was removed at Nellis Air Force Base. Uh, as the years went along, I continued to have various problems. I had headaches and I was taking 40 and 50 aspirins a day, not realizing what they do to your stomach. I just take them on with nothing on my stomach and that was creating other problems which created depression and, and uh, problems and then I began to drink quite a bit and was irresponsible. I tried to fight that off and for times I would do well. Finally, I began to find out information about Agent Orange and the various sprays, so I went to the VA in Las Vegas and I stated my concerns and he said, uh, the military stance on that is uh, None of the agents that they used for defoliating and other things uh, creates any harm. To, and I mentioned to him with several guys and that, and he said, well, that's their official stance on that. So I let it go, and uh, then I began to have problems. I had the, the linings removed from my testicles. I had vertebrae removed in my neck. Uh, I had my shoulders and things treated for different things when I was in Florida. Finally, I had open heart surgery. I had double bypasses since that time. I've had cartilage and the arteries removed in my neck. I've had five stents replaced in my body. And I had a minor surgery on my hand the VA hospital in Salt Lake and they tied my arm back into a situation to where it tore the, the muscles in my rotary cuff and the VA denied it. They said that their doctors was too well trained and it was impossible for them to make a mistake, which I talked to many specialists since then and they said that's, all of us make mistakes. We make mistakes every single day. but. The VA denied that. I've been in and out of hospitals. I've had so many surgeries for diverticulitis. I have prostate cancer that's now spread to my bones. The VA is in denial of all that, trying to get. When I went to the VA and they discovered my cancer, he said, well, don't worry about cancer. Your heart's going to kill you within a year anyway. You're going to die. I asked him if he was a cardiologist, and he said no. 
but I might buy you some time on the cancer, but you're going to die. Yeah, I can't do surgery because you'll die on the operating t hit table. Your heart will stop. So not liking that, I came back, I went to Intermountain Healthcare and seen a heart specialist and he said that's the most ridiculous thing I ever heard of. And then I went to a cancer specialist and they said no, there's all kinds of treatment, hormone therapy and things that I'm on now. But because of this situation in Salt Lake, which is a very hardship, 700 miles round trip in the middle of the winter, with a wife that can't drive because of knee replacements. I can't see at night, she can't see at night. I have carried the burden of all these expenses and all these surgeries. And everything I put in for it, I went to St. George, I applied for choices because it's 700 miles away to see a doctor in this area and I was denied. So my experiences since I got out of the military is very, very negative. The VA has let me down. They've let thousands and thousands of other veterans down. And as I sit here today, I'm suffering from numerous things and problems and still cannot get choices. I would have to make that trip back and forth, which is almost physically impossible. And so the medical bills just continue to rise and continue to rise. And all of my appeals and all of my claims continued to get denied. And that's where I sat here today.